Hey, welcome back. It's Costa Cubicle here. I want to thank you for tuning in. If you're returning, I appreciate all the support. And if you're new here, welcome. Settle in with that coffee or preferred beverage because, as always, we got a couple of bodies to talk about. This is a little different as the bodies this time have never been found. Today, we discuss five disturbing unsolved disappearances. So without further ado, sit back, relax. Let's get into it. Number one, the lost colony of Roanoke. The establishment of the Roanoke colony was an attempt by Sir Walter Raleigh to found the first permanent English settlement in America. The colony was founded in 1585 but it was visited by a ship in 1590 and the crew found that the colonists had disappeared under unknown circumstances. It has come to be known as the Lost Colony and the fate of 112 to 121 colonists remain unknown to this day. Roanoke was founded by Governor Ralph Lane in 1585 on Roanoke Island in present-day Dare County, North Carolina. Lane's colony was troubled by a lack of supplies and poor relations with some of the local American Indian tribes. A resupply mission by Sir Richard Grenville was delayed, so Lane abandoned the colony and returned to England with Sir Francis Drake in 1586. Grenville arrived two weeks later and also returned home, leaving behind a small detachment to protect Raleigh's claim. A second expedition, led by John White, landed on the same island in 1587 and set up another settlement. Sir Walter Raleigh had sent him to establish the city of Raleigh in Chesapeake Bay. That attempt became known as the Lost Colony due to the unexplained disappearance of its population. During a stop to check on Grenville's men, flagship pilot Simon Fernandez forced White and his colonists to remain on Roanoke. White returned to England with Ferdinand, intending to bring more supplies in 1588. The Anglo-Spanish War delayed his return to Roanoke until 1590, and he found the settlement fortified, but abandoned. The cryptic word Croatoan was found carved into the palisade, which White interpreted to mean that the colonists had relocated to Croatoan Island. Before he could follow this lead, rough seas and a lost anchor forced the mission to return to England. The fate of approximately 112 to 121 colonists remain unknown. Speculation that they had assimilated with nearby Indian communities appears in writings as early as 1605. Investigations by the Jamestown colonists produced reports that the Roanoke settlers had been massacred. And there were stories of people with European features being seen in Indian villages. But no conclusive evidence was found. Interest in the matter fell into decline in 1834 when George Bancroft published his account of the events in A History of the United States. Bancroft's description of the colonists, particularly White's infant granddaughter Virginia Dare, cast them as foundational figures in American culture and captured the public imagination. Despite this renewed interest, Modern research has failed to find archaeological evidence to explain the disappearance of the Roanoke colonists. Number 2. Maura Murray Maura is an American woman who disappeared on the evening of February 9, 2004, after a car crash on Route 112 near Woodsville, New Hampshire a village in the town of Harville. Her whereabouts remain unknown. 
She was a 21-year-old nursing student completing her junior year at the University of Massachusetts, Amherst, at the time of her disappearance. After midnight on Monday, February 9th, Murray used her personal computer to search MapQuest for directions to Berkshires and Burlington, Vermont. The first reported contact Murray had with anyone on February 9th was at 1 p.m., when she emailed her boyfriend. I love you more, stud. I got your messages. But honestly, I didn't feel like talking too much to anyone. I promised to call you today, though. Love you. Mora. She also made a phone call inquiring about renting a condominium at the same time at the same Bartlett, New Hampshire condo association with which her family had vacationed in the past. Telephone records indicate the call lasted three minutes. The owner did not rent the condo to Murray. At 1.13 p.m., Murray called a fellow nursing student for reasons unknown. On the afternoon of Monday, February 9th, at 1.24 p.m., Murray emailed her work supervisor of the nursing school facility that she would be out of town for a week due to a death in her family. According to her family, the family had not experienced a death. She also said she would contact them when she returned. At 2.05 p.m., Murray called a number which provides recorded information about booking hotels in Stowe, Vermont. The call lasted approximately five minutes. At 2.18, she telephoned her boyfriend and left a voice message promising him they would talk later. This call ended after one minute. In her car, Murray packed clothing, toiletries, college textbooks, and birth control pills. When her room was searched later, Campus police discovered most of her belongings packed in boxes and the art removed from the walls. It's not clear whether Murray packed them that day, but police at the time said that she packed between Sunday night and Monday morning. On top of the boxes was a printed email to Murray's boyfriend indicating trouble in the relationship. Around 3.30 p.m., she drove off the campus in her black 1996 Saturn sedan. Classes at the university had been canceled that day due to a snowstorm. At 3.40 p.m., Murray withdrew $280 from an ATM. Closed circuit footage showed she was alone. At a nearby liquor store, Murray purchased about $40 worth of alcoholic beverages, including Bailey's Irish Cream, Kahlua, vodka, and a box of Franzia wine. Security footage again shows she was alone when she made that purchase. At some point in the day, she also picked up accident report forms from Massachusetts Registry of Motor Vehicles. Sometime after 7 p.m., a Woodsville, New Hampshire resident heard a loud thump outside of her house. Through her window, she could see a car up against the snowbank along Route 112, also known as Wild and Mossiac Road. The car pointed west on the eastbound side of the road. At 7.27 p.m., the local woman reported the car accident on the sharp corner of Route 112 adjacent to her home. She telephoned the Sheriff's Department at 7.27 to report the accident. According to the 911 log, the woman claimed to have seen a man smoking a cigarette inside the car. However, she later stated that she had not seen a man, nor a person, smoking a cigarette, but rather had seen what appeared to be a red light glowing from inside the car, potentially from a cell phone. A passing motorist, a school bus driver who lived nearby, stopped at the scene. They saw the car as well as a young woman walking around the vehicle. The school bus driver noticed the young woman was not bleeding or visibly injured, but cold and shivering. 
He offered to call for help. She asked him not to call the police and assured him she had already called AAA. However, AAA has no record of any such call. Knowing there was no cellular reception in the area, the bus driver continued home and called the police. His call was received by the Sheriff's Department at 7.43 p.m. He was unable to see Murray's car while he made the call, but did notice several cars pass on the road before the police arrived. Another local resident driving home from work claimed she passed by the scene around 7.37 and saw a police SUV parked face-to-face with Murray's car. She pulled over briefly and did not see anyone inside or outside the cars and decided to continue home. The witness's statement contradicts the official police log, which has Haverhill police arriving nine minutes after the fact. According to the official log, at 7.46 p.m., a Haverhill police officer arrived at the scene, but the woman driver had already disappeared. No one was inside or around the car, and the car had impacted the tree on the driver's side of the vehicle, severely damaging the left headlight and pushing the car's radiator into the fan, rendering it inoperable. The car's windshield was cracked on the driver's side and both airbags had been deployed, but the car was locked. Inside and outside of the car, he discovered red stains that looked like red wine. Inside the car, the officer found an empty beer bottle and a damaged box of Franzia wine on the rear seat. In addition, he found a AAA card issued to Murray blank accident report forms, gloves, compact discs, makeup, diamond jewelry, driving directions to Burlington, Vermont, Murray's favorite stuffed animal, and Not Without Peril, a book about mountain climbing in the White Mountains. Missing were Murray's debit card, credit card, cell phone, and Murray herself, none of which has been located. Number three, Jimmy Hoffa. Presumed dead July 30th, 1982. Jimmy was a prominent American labor union leader who served as the president of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters, IBT, from 1957 to 1971. From a young age, Hoffa was dedicated to union activism quickly rising to prominence within the IBT. By the age of 25, he became a significant regional figure, eventually becoming the national vice president in 1952. And the regional general president in 1957 to 1971. Under his leadership, the union achieved its first national agreement for the Teamsters. In 1964, through the National Master Freight Agreement, contributing to the union's growth to over 2.3 million members at its peak. However, Hoffa's involvement with organized crime began early in his Teamsters career, persisting until his mysterious disappearance in 1975. In 1964, he faced convictions for jury tampering, attempted bribery, conspiracy, and mail and wire fraud in two separate trials. After being imprisoned in 1967 and sentenced to 13 years, Hoffa resigned as president of the union in 1971 as part of a computation agreement with President Richard Nixon. Although released later that year, he was barred from union activities until 1980. And his attempts to overturn the order were unsuccessful. The turning point came July 30th, 1975, when Hoffa disappeared after a meeting with Anthony Provenzano and Anthony Gaclion at the Marcus Red Fox restaurant in Bloomfield Township, a Detroit suburb. Despite having a personal connection to the venue, 
as it had hosted his son's wedding reception, the meeting did not go as planned. Hoffa, frustrated by the absence of Gacleon, called his wife from a payphone and expressed annoyance. Witnesses reported seeing Hoffa pacing the restaurant's parking lot and conversing with individuals who recognized and greeted him. Eventually, he left the location without a struggle. One witness even reported seeing him in the back of a maroon Lincoln or Mercury with three other people. On March 18, 2000, joggers near Mount Baker Highway in Watnam County, Washington, stumbled upon a wrecked vehicle at the bottom of an embankment near Canyon Creek, a tributary of the North Fork of the Nooksack River. Responding deputies discovered a white 1993 Jeep Cherokee with North Carolina license plates. The vehicle was registered to Leah Roberts. Born on July 23, 1976, who had abruptly left her Durham, North Carolina home nine days prior. Investigations revealed that a man had reported seeing Roberts in a disoriented state at a gas station in Everett, Washington, shortly after the discovery of the wrecked car. However, her current whereabouts remain unknown. Leading up to her disappearance, Roberts experienced significant life challenges, including the death of both of her parents and surviving a serious car accident. These events had prompted her to reflect on spiritual matters and question the trajectory of her life. Just months before completing her studies at North Carolina State University, she dropped out and began spending much of her time in a local coffee house, engaging in activities like writing poetry in her journal. A note left at her house suggested inspiration drawn from John Couric's work, particularly the Dharma Bums, which features scenes set at a desolation peak near where her abandoned car was discovered. Despite her sudden departure, Roberts had left money for her housemate, indicating an expectation to return within a month. The investigation focused on potentially contradictory evidence within Roberts' car. Documents indicated her presence in Bellingham, Washington by March 13th, five days before the vehicle was found. Initial suspicions of intentional wreckage were confirmed when the car's starter motor was later found to have been tampered with. Blankets hung across the car's windows, suggesting it's used as a shelter after the crash. And personal belongings scattered nearby dispelled robbery as a motive, as money and jewelry were among the items found as well. Despite being featured on TV shows like Unsolved Mysteries and Disappeared, the case has yielded few leads. In the summer of 2005, Volunteers from a North Carolina Missing Persons Awareness Group organized a cross-country caravan to raise awareness for Leah's case, making it an annual event. The Disappearance of Summer Wells Four-year-old Summer Wells resided with her parents and three brothers in rural Hawkins County, Tennessee. Their grandmother lived nearby in a camping RV. On June 15, 2021, Summer enjoyed a cheerful day swimming with her mother, Candace, and grandmother, Candy, at a local creek. Upon returning home, Summer joined the two women in planting flowers before expressing a desire to go inside with her brothers. Candace escorted Summer back to the camping RV, stopping just shy of the family's home's entrance. Later, Candace recalled being close enough to observe Summer's brothers inside, engrossed in watching YouTube videos. The last known sighting of Summer occurred when Candace watched her daughter enter the front door. 
She then entrusted her three brothers with keeping an eye on Summer while she returned to the camper to assist Candy with an e-brace. The precise duration before Candace returned to the home is not publicly disclosed. However, local news in Tennessee reported that Summer was last seen descending the stairs to the basement, holding her toys. According to this timeline, it is likely the Summer's brothers were the last to witness her that day. A lot of theories surround Summer's disappearance, including the obvious ones. Kidnapping, murder, familial side. But as of now, nobody knows the truth. Hey, thanks so much for tuning in and sticking around until the end. I really appreciate it. If you're a returning viewer, thank you for the continued support. And if you're new here, consider liking and subscribing uh, just to be informed when we like come out with new content. Um, we're trying to build a community here, as always. So let me know in the comments what you liked or what you didn't like. I'm open to ambiguity. Um, if you're returning, you may notice that this is an entirely new format compared to what we usually do here. So, I'm trying to something new. We're always evolving. So let me know if you liked it, if you didn't like it. I'm trying to get a little more personal with you guys. So until next time, take care of yourselves and have a good night.